last couple of weeks, I have felt direction for months now to come to this church and talk about topics that honestly don't get talked about enough and wanting to do it in the right spirit at the right time to have its greatest effect on everyone that's listening. I don't take this moment for granted. I don't take this audience for granted. I'm humbled by what God is challenging me with right now. Last Sunday, I spoke about heaven, the promise of heaven, the assurance of heaven, the reality of heaven. As I have told you that today I will speak on the subject hell. And I know when I say that word, so many feelings and thoughts begin to cloud our judgment, our hearts. And I assure you that God is wanting to let his word guide and lead us today. I want you to know that pastor doesn't come throwing stones or in a spirit of condemnation. I come with a spirit of honest awareness, honest biblical discussion. I come with the reality that these are true, whether I mention them or not, they are true. And I know sometimes when I mention hell, we can go a lot of different directions. We sometimes encourage people to go to hell. We sometimes lose our cell phone or don't have Wi-Fi or our car messes up and we'll say, I'm in cell phone hell. I'm on Wi-Fi hell. And we think little inconveniences of our lives or little irritations of our lives place us in a place that honestly is the best description we can give on this planet Earth. And yet scripture has an entirely different view. I bring to you one of the strongest teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on this subject. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. And if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read a little bit more verses than I normally do to capture the whole story. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivedest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that they, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. The last verse. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. God, your word is holy and your word is true. Help me, Lord, to convey what you have placed in my spirit and what you have worked in my heart that I can do it in a way that God matters, makes an effect on lives and changes eternal destinies. Today is not a throwaway Sunday. Today may be my one and only chance to ever speak into the eternal soul of an individual that's watching or here. So I take the sacred holy moment and I pray, God, for you to anoint it. Place an anointed coal on my lips to preach, teach, and lead your precious people in this congregation. Anoint our ears to receive. 
We give you all praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. amen. My subject this morning is God does not want anyone to spend eternity in hell. You may be seated. Peter Kreft writes, of all the doctrines in Christianity, hell is probably the most difficult to defend, the most burdensome to believe, and the first to be abandoned. Atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell put the objection this way, I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. Charles Darwin pointed to the doctrine of hell as one of the significant reasons for his own abandonment of the Christian faith. In his autobiography, he wrote, I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true. Hell presents multiple obstacles for people. It raises several questions in people's mind as they contend with this understanding, this reality, this doctrine, this teaching, this idea of hell. Questions are real. You may have asked them, how can an all-loving God, a compassionate, caring God, how could a God judge people how does God condemn people eternally for what they do in a finite amount of time? How could God do that justly? Or the question could be, why is it even necessary for hell to involve a kind of torture? Like, why would God use that if God is a compassionate, caring God? These are legitimate questions. I, I don't undermine any of those obstacles or challenges that people would raise when you begin to discuss the doctrine of hell. C.S. Lewis, a great apologist, correctly wrote when he said, there is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom, and it has the support of reason. It has the support of logical, intelligent thinking. I give you two arguments for your consideration, two common objections, if you will, two arguments for you to consider. Number one is, I can't believe a loving God would send people to hell. I can't believe in a God like that. I can't serve a God. I don't want to identify or surrender to a God that would send people to hell. When we say, I can't believe in a God that would, what, do something you would and I wouldn't do? Think in a way you and I wouldn't think? Have we ever considered the possibility that God, the creator of humanity, his sense of judgment is more developed and more pure and more online than our own. That his love and mercy compels him to be the understanding of justice and love and the balance between kindness and punishment. We may be the one with a flawed view of what is fair. Isaiah, the writer in scripture, gives us some deep understanding of this logic. When he writes in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, For my thoughts, God is saying, are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. God wants it to be very clear that we cannot always conceive or, or contemplate or consider the way that God thinks. There are things that God does that we will never fully understand, maybe one day when we get to ask him questions in heaven. 
But when we read the Bible and we look at all the things God does in Scripture, there are a lot of things that God does throughout the Scripture that I would never consider. You and I would never deem the right move when God would curse the earth because of the sin of Adam and Eve. Would you and I have considered that? That God would turn Lot's wife into a pillar of salt for one turn and looking back for one. Would that be something that you would have thought? Is that something that I would have considered? I dare say we wouldn't. Would you and I have considered to leave the splendor of heaven and robe himself in flesh and become man and go through the pain and the suffering of a cross that one day you and I could be free? Is there other options that he could have employed? Is there other ideas he could have used? Certainly, you and I would not have been the first to birth that idea. There are many things in Scripture that God does that you and I would have never thought of. So when we say God wouldn't do this or God wouldn't do that, what we're trying to do is bring God down to our reasoning and our rationale. And yet Scripture always wants you to understand his ways are so much higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Can I get you to consider another objection? And that is this, that hell is just unjust. The punishment doesn't fit the crime. Hell is way too heavy-handed. Goes on far too long for what seems to be some fraction or some minor fault or some minor issue. Many of our objections or beliefs are formulated by our culture and by those that are authoritative verses or voices in our lives. Your sense of justice and your sense and my sense of what is right and wrong is mostly influenced by our world and by our culture and by the society that we live in. What those that shout and champion as unjust begins to have some influence and some effect on our life. But just because we don't like a doctrine does not make it not true. When you get outside of Western culture, when you get out of side our middle state Tennessee, when you remove yourselves from our influence of North America, actually the opposite view is more true. They see the evil in other places around the world. They see the evil that people commit and wonder how God could just be just if he allows that to go unpunished. In villages in Africa, in the Middle East, in India, in China, innocent men and women and children are raped, kidnapped, and tortured, are killed on a daily basis. For them, for them to see their family members dragged out and abused and mistreated, for them, God cannot be a loving God worth worshiping if he doesn't punish that type of behavior. When they see that injustice, they cannot believe that there's a God that does not have a hell that would punish somebody that does that to them, their villages, their family, and their loved ones. When we suggest that everyone gets into heaven because God's good, for many, that sounds downright awful and unjust. For many, they could not serve and surrender and believe a God that does not punish people that have pure evil and does faulty things that harm and bring around pain in life. If God is truly just, then there has to be a hell. Does it make us uncomfortable? Yes, but it also makes sense that there is a God that sees all and knows how to render justice to all. What I want you to understand and what I want you to receive today is this truth. A rejection of hell necessarily entails a rejection of Jesus. When you reject the idea, the doctrine, the belief, the understanding of hell, you literally have to reject Jesus. One reason we need to talk about hell is that it is not a peripheral issue. It's connected closely with the person of Jesus and his teachings. When you look at the subject of hell throughout Scripture and through the Old Testament and the New Testament, what you come to understand is we don't get a clear, refined doctrine of hell in the Bible until we get to Jesus. 
Jesus is the one that begins to crystallize and to get greater understanding and, and to get our minds to realize that there is this reality of hell. Jesus taught about hell of 1800, over 1800 of scriptures that Jesus is teaching. 13% of them talk about hell, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, and punishment. I give you a few for you to understand. Matthew 25 will say, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, ye cursed, and do eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Matthew 8, 12 will say, but some will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus didn't shy and he didn't try to dial back. He didn't try to really put a velvet understanding on this idea of hell. He used words and languages that cast your attention that drew you in he tried to get you to understand the severity the importance the depth the reality of this thing that we are uh, wanting from and things we don't like this doctrine of hell so the truth is if you want to get rid of hell you have to get rid of Jesus because Jesus is the one that taught and Jesus is the one that explained and Jesus is the one that brought the subject of hell into the conversation more than anybody throughout scripture. So what did Jesus say? What were some of those? There's no way that I can extrapolate of all Jesus' teachings about hell, even the verses that I read about the rich man in hell, even them, even that story, even that reality, there is something about that. I cannot do a deep dive and talk about all of the nuances and all of the revelations and all of the truths in that story, but I give you three to consider. Number one, what Jesus said was hell is an actual location. The Bible says this in the story that we read, in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Hell in the Bible is an immediate and ultimate location. Hell or Hades. And then after the white throne judgment, the lake of fire, which is the second death. These are realities. Here is what you cannot do. And here's what is as the warning of scripture that reminds us, you cannot do this. You cannot believe there is an actual heaven and believe that there is no hell. If you believe in a heaven, then you also have to believe in hell. Hell is just as real of a, as of a location as heaven is. Jesus, I want you to understand this, talked more about hell than he did heaven. Revelation 118, I bring this to you for you to get a depth of revelation in this one verse. Revelation 118 says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. I want you to notice the language and the words. I have the keys to hell and death. We talk more about the keys to death because you know what the keys of death is. The key of death is life. That's why he will tell you, I have the key that unlocks the prison of death. I have the key that frees the souls from death because I'm the one that can give you life eternally. I'm the one that has the key. But the logical understanding and conclusion has to be, if he has the key of death, then he has the key of hell. So if death is real, then hell has to be real. If you believe in death, which you do, then you also have to believe, according to the words of Jesus, that hell is also real. We cannot change that. No matter how much we would detest it or change it out of our own desire to help all in humanity, I could tell you and arguably come through you with logical reasoning that there will be more people in hell than there will be heaven. Scripture reminds us time that it is hell that has enlarged itself, not heaven. Heaven has already been determined its dimension. We talked about that last week. It's hell that continues to grow. Why? Because population continues to grow. I could go down that road logically, but what I need you to understand is you cannot believe in death and not believe in hell. Why? Because Jesus said, I have the keys to both death and hell. Second thing Jesus taught is hell is a place of indescribable 
and eternal torment. Now, to be clear and to be honest and factual, there's just no way that I can adequately depict and describe. If I was the pristine storyteller, there is no just way that I could ever actually place us in that moment to see what this really looks like. But the Bible doesn't back away from its realities. And so it gives us scriptures and stories and understandings. Luke 13, Jesus used the phrase like weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mark 9, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Matthew 25 says, to everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Luke, in our own reading this morning, is the most descriptive when it would read in verse 24, and he said, cried and said, Father Abraham, mercy on me, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented and in this flame. The the language and the the unction and and the desperation is hard to fathom. Through the pain and through the reality of this, it's it's hard to grasp while we sit in an air conditioning room. I realize I'm taking you on a journey. You're not mentally and emotionally prepared for. I realize that, but scripture wants you to realize that this man desired just a drop, just a drop, just a drop of water, and yet that wasn't available. So here's the logic question. Here's the understanding I need you to get. I I want to discuss something that you may never have heard before or may have never considered. I want you to contemplate something that may be new and fresh to this idea of hell for you, but I want to give it to you because it's true. The question is, why is hell that way? Why is hell described in terms of torment and pain and torture? Why is hell described that way? Why is hell described in the language that scripture uses? Why the anguish? Why the pain? Why the suffering? Why why the isolation? Why is it described in such terms? I want you to understand because God, who is the life-giving source of everything that is good, The Bible says all good things come down from above. All the good things of this life. All the good things that we enjoy. All the things that we like. All the things that bring joy. Things that bring pleasure and laughter and art and music and food and sex and water. All the things that make life doable and pleasant. All the things that life has given us that are good. Can I remind you, those come from God. That God is the one that bestows him. It's the common grace of God. It is what God gives humanity. It is what God's poured out. So what happens when you remove the common grace of God? When you remove laughter and joy and peace and comfort and water and sex and what do you will, it happens when you remove pleasure and you remove. The only way you can describe the depravity of God It's through terms of torment and anguish and pain. The the scripture doesn't leave this for our argument. The scripture wants you to understand this. So it gives us the most basic element to prove this point. The most basic understanding that the common denominator for all of us is water. St. Lazarus, to dip the end of his finger in water, that he could put it on my tongue, meaning even one solitary drop of water is not even in hell. The common grace of God does not exist. So when you take God out of life and when you take God out of existence and when you take God out of of you, the only thing that is left is a dying, tormented, broken, hollowed out life and existence. That's why hell is given in terms of anguish and pain. Have you ever been thirsty? Have you ever gone so far that you you desired water and and you how uncomfortable you got for water because of the lack of water that you 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 would stop at the nearest convenience because you needed just a a drink of water? Can you imagine living eternity without even a, a drink of water? How would you describe that? 
How would you describe it? You, you want me to take it a little bit further? I think the greatest part of hell and the most painful part of hell is not the depravity of the common grace of God, is that you will still have your memory and that you will know of the time that you were in the presence of God and that you will remind yourself of the moments uh, that you could have reached out to God and you could have turned your life over and you could have uh, tasted and seen that the Lord is good and you chose not to. But the greatest, most depraved part of it is that you will never be able to feel God again. That is why hell is described in terms that are haunting. That is why it is described in terms that are so desperate in measure. We've never been there. We don't know what it's like. But can I tell you, people starve to death. Do you realize, do you realize that death is a gift of God? Do you realize that how precious in the sight of God is the death of his saints? But when you're so deprived that God doesn't even give you the gift of death. We don't look at it terms like that. I realize that. I understand that. But God understands his ways are higher than our ways. And his ways and thoughts are higher than our ways. That he realizes that he takes us out of this world. So we don't live in hell on earth. That he removes us from that. Because he realizes also that there is an eternal place. That he there's death that does not exist that you live forever and ever deprived with no joy with no peace no sense of comfort nothing that will make your heart well nothing that makes it pleasurable nothing all that the goodness of your life you get in your car you breathe in air the food that you eat for lunch the water that you will drink may I remind you you don't do that of your own good graces the grace the grace of God has been bestowed to you and that's why you have air in your lungs and you have a mind to think and you have clothes on you and you have a vehicle and a home you need to thank God for the common grace of God <laughs> number three thing that Jesus taught is that your choices echo in eternity. In each one of us is something is growing, something that is growing that will result in hell if it is not curbed. In each and every one of us, something is developing that will send us to hell if it is not dealt with or defeated. It will turn us into a kind of person that is defined by selfishness or rebellion. And that decision in life will echo into eternity. The scripture wanted you to know this, that the decisions you make now, the, the, the purpose of life now is to prepare you for eternity somewhere. The reason you have this time now is to make decisions that will place your eternal existence in a place of heaven because a choice not to choose heaven is not a choice just to be in neutral. There's only two options. So Jesus does some insane teaching. Jesus does some crazy teaching. Jesus teaches things that you don't hear anymore. Jesus teaches things that make you sit up and think, is he serious? Like, is he really meaning that? Is that what he's thinking? Jesus does some tough, tough, tough teaching. And he's not shy about it. And it's all for one purpose, that you would not end up in hell. I give it to you. It's in your Bible. Mark 9, 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into light in the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than have two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and to be cast into hell fire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I don't know how more drastic you can get. 
I don't know how much you can say that is insane, crazy teaching. And yet Jesus doesn't back up and he doesn't apologize and he doesn't put it in the fine print. He wants you to know whatever you have to do to make sure that you go to heaven, you will be grateful and be glad that you laid it all, you surrendered it all, and you gave it all to God. Whatever you would have to do, imagine the thinking, imagine the audience, imagine the people that are thinking, I don't know if he's serious, is this some parable? Is this some understanding that one day will make sense? Or was he real? I give you for your consideration that the juxtaposition here is against hell, not just the comforts of life and not just carrying your cross, but you have to get drastic some time to make sure. Can I use that word again? Uh, when's the last time you asked your own soul? I have to get drastic with myself to make sure I make heaven my home. I need to get drastic about making sure that I'm well and right and living righteously and godly in this present world. That God, whatever is hindering, whatever is stopping, whatever the trick of the enemy, I'm reaching for some of you. And whatever's trying to get in my spirit, whatever's trying to put a hook in my soul, whatever's trying to derail me from my walk with God, can I tell you one day, ladies and gentlemen, that will not matter. That will not matter. That will not matter. You will gladly exchange, the Bible says, this, uh, for what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If a man gains the whole world, if a man wins the whole world, if you put Elon Musk and Bezos together and you combine their worldly wealth and accomplishment together, it would not be worth the one soul you have. Together, together, a man cannot even gain the whole world because Jesus' drastic teaching wants you to understand you can't put it on the scale that's worth your eternal soul. A man cannot even gain all of Goodlettsville. A man cannot even gain all of Goodlettsville. But Jesus stretched it out so broad, so pure, audacious. Jesus put it out in such terms that, that, that you couldn't miss the understanding. You couldn't miss the teaching if you gain the whole world. No logical individual thinks they can gain the whole world. There's nobody that really believes they can be and gain the whole world. No Nobody thinks that, but if you could, if you were able, if you had that ability, even then, Jesus would want you to know what is more valuable than all of these is that your eternal, ever-living soul. So I bring it to you, and I bring it to you for your consideration. Whatever you have to give up, whatever you have to give up to go to heaven, you have to give up to go to hell. Whatever you have to surrender, I don't know if it's a friend, a girlfriend, boyfriend. I don't know if it's a, a road you're on. I don't know if it's a path you're on. I don't know if it's a habit. I don't know if it's something you're dabbling with. I don't know if it's a past thing, but can I just tell you, whatever you have to surrender, you don't get to take that with you. You don't get to take that with you. You, you don't get to take that with you. There, there are no U-Haul trailers going to hell. There, there, you don't get to take that with you. Whatever's stopping you from fully surrendering, and I need to park the car right here for a moment. Whatever's stopping you from fully being submitted and fully surrendering and fully yielding yourself and fully saying, God, whatever it takes, whatever I have to do, I want to make sure that I'm ready. I want to make sure that I make heaven my home. Whatever you have to do, it will be worth it one day. But here is the most challenging part of this story. This is what scares me. Hear me. This is what I cannot wrap my logic around. And I don't understand all of this point. What I'm about to share with you causes me to shudder. It's what makes theologians and those that study this ponder and consider this point that I'm about to make is what causes people to say, how do we figure that out? And it is simply this, that the rich man in hell looks up with his memory, with his voice, with his understanding. There's Abraham, there's Lazarus. He has knowledge. And in this knowledge, he knows when Abraham says, you lived a good life. You had whatever you wanted. You had a lot of pleasures, a lot of opportunity. He has full understanding. Nothing has to be explained to him when Abraham is conversing with him. And his response is this. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in the water to tip it on my tongue. He asked for water. 
When that request is denied, he asks that his brothers, the Lazarus would be sent back and that his brothers would be witnessed to. Now he's concerned about so many and, and, and he wants his brothers to be warned, don't come here. And, and, and he asks that there would be an evangelist, there would be a Bible study teacher, there would be somebody that would be concerned about his brothers so that his five brothers, he now acknowledges, I know my family members, I know who they are, I know the oldest, the youngest, I know where I am in the bunch. He has knowledge of life. You hear me? He knows that request. But what befuddles us is in his request for asking, he never asked to leave. He never asked for him to get out. He never asked, can we get a redo here? I didn't know it was like this. I didn't, I didn't take it as serious as I should. Can, can, can I go back and can, can, we, can we do this scene over again? He never asked to leave. What is befuddling to me, what, what, what mesmerizes those that study this is that you can be so twisted up by life and sin that you don't even think there's hope. You don't even consider there's another option. You think your life is always die cast in this reality and you will forever have to live with this result and this decision. You can be so twisted up. You don't think you can change. You don't ever think you can have a difference. You don't ever think your life could be anything else. You think this is how it is. And he never asked to leave. Never asked. Never asked. Never asked. How we could get so bogged down and you could get so twisted up in your thinking that you don't think you could ever change and your life will be, always be like it is. And I, I made my bed, I'm going to lay in it and I, this is the way it's going to end up. But I've come to tell you today uh, that there is a chance for you to change. Uh, it is a full surrender and say, God, uh, I yield myself to you. I need you, God. Nothing, nothing in the Bible, nothing we read in Scripture suggests that people stop desiring sin, thinking about sin, stop surrendering to God. Nothing in Scripture tells us that we stop desiring our life and our lifestyle. Nothing stops us from thinking that way and surrendering to God. Nothing stops us from thinking that. Sin continues to control our lives to the degree that we don't even feel we can change. To me, that's the hopeless, scary part of the story. You don't think you can change. You don't think that you'll be better. You don't think you could be free. You don't think you could have what God has for you. I've come to tell you, I believe you, God's grace can change your life. I believe that God could fill you with more hope and more joy than you've ever had. I believe that God can renew your faith to the degree you're never the same again. I believe that God can transform your thinking and your mind and how you feel about your past and the things that you've done that are under the blood. I think God can absolutely, utterly transform your life. That's not a religious statement. That's a truth statement because there are those in this room that were lost in sin and addicted and bound and fettered by things of this life, but they will tell you that you can win by the power and the grace of God. Yes, it's a fight. Yes, there's a battle. Yes, there is a reality, but we stand today to testify that the power of God, the Holy Ghost, the blood of the Lamb, the Word of God, the Spirit of Almighty God can absolutely come into your life and turn your life upside down. Can I just get a good amen in the house? Brother Dago, you can come. I'm almost done. See, what I have discovered and what Scripture wants us to know is you can't get people to live for God by fear. Like, I, I could scare you and I could paint, show you videos and pictures and try to get images. Do you know Hollywood? If you want to know why horror movies are worse horror movies than you've ever seen, like, even, even the trailers of horror movies are, like, utterly, like, evil, okay? You want to know why? Because Satan wants you to view evil and hell and demonic and all of that in degrees that you're numb now. Like it doesn't even phase you anymore. 
Hollywood can paint evil and hell so so creatively and so audaciously that you, you don't even view, there's no picture that I could show you that will rival that. And what it does is numb you to the reality that this is true. I can't, I can't scare you. I know scripture says in Jude and some saved by fear. I, I do hope that somewhere in this that you are convicted I, I do hope that somewhere in this message that there's something inside of you that says, I, I need to make sure that I'm right and I'm in alignment and I'm not fighting for things that are not going to be eternally worth it. I, I need to make sure. I, I hope that there is. But the majority of people are not trying to avoid hell, and that's why they live for God. The real answer of, of, of that, the real answer, again, it's in the story. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, when, when Abraham said, no, I'm not sending Lazarus. We can't go from here. There's a gulf between us. That's not possible. And he says, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, like let the supernatural happen, they will repent. And he said unto them, if they won't hear Moses and they won't hear the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. I could get a momentary emotion. I could get a momentary decision. I could get you to, to, for two weeks, come to church, and then you fall back to your old lifestyle. I, I could get you to read your Bible for maybe two or three days, maybe this week if I'm lucky, but you'll revert back to your old ways back and, and go back to your old lifestyle and old habits. I, I realize there could be some needle movement in your spirituality. I realize that. But nobody, no, but the majority of people don't shift that way. The only way you truly walk away from your old Life and sin is that you have to fall in love with something that's better. I don't live for God because I, want, I don't want to go to hell. Now be clear, I don't want to go to hell. I have lived for God in my lifetime out of fear of missing the rapture. I don't want to live for God because I want to avoid a place. I want to live for God because I have fallen in love with Jesus. But I, I want to see him. I want to be in his presence. I want to be captured again by the wowing grace of God. I, I want to be wowed by, by the beauty and the majesty and the glory my Savior. I can't scare you out of hell into heaven. But what I can invite you to say when you fall in love with Jesus, it shifts the game. When I want more of him than I want this life. I want more of him than I want of this world's accomplishments. My job today is not to scare you. My job today is to present a savior that died for you so you couldn't. If you want to know how bad hell is, all you have to do is look at Calvary. If hell was a non-issue, no big deal. If hell was a simple thing, then Calvary wouldn't have to be so drastic. The reason the Calvary is so gruesome, brutal, so cruel, so painful, is he's a savior. What is he trying to save you from? What is he trying to save you from? He's trying to save you from eternal separation from him. See, I believe God doesn't want anyone to spend eternity in hell. God doesn't want anyone, nobody. God doesn't want anybody to be lost forever. I was going through my own notes and I saw this slide from Sister Vesta Megan from Because of the Times. And she threw this slide on. And it was this. If men go to hell, who cares? I do. But not enough. Let 
Like it's not an issue anymore. It's not preached about enough. There are even liberal theologians that denounce the idea of hell and, and would persuade swaths of people that there's never a place for you to be eternally lost. And yet, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us who are not willing, not willing, not willing that any should perish, not willing that not one, not anyone, but that all should come to repentance. It is the will of God for you to fall in love with him and turn your life over to him and say, God, I'm tired of living out of fear, living out of fear of missing the rapture, going to hell and m missing out with you. I, I'm tired of living at that low level. I, I'm, I, I want to change that. I'm ready to grow my relationship where I'm more in love with Jesus than I am this world and this life. I, I am more in love with Jesus than I'm anything that I've ever accomplished. God's reaching for you. Would you stand all across this house? God's reaching. Would you bow your head? I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're feeling. I don't know what you're going through. I just know I have been led by the Holy Ghost to come boldly to this church and come to you and say, come on. How long will you be wishy-washy and how long will you live a double life? How, how long will you be inconsistent? How long will you, will, you, will you not surrender your will? How long will you fight against what God's trying to, how long will it take you? What the hell do you want? What is worth your eternal soul? What, what, what is there that is more precious than what God's calling you to do? I also want to recognize that I want to fall in love with Jesus more. When I see the vastness and the reality of hell, it might reminds me of how much he loves me. You loved me that much to spare and save me, redeem my soul, that I would not have to live eternally there. You didn't have to, but you did. Lord Jesus, your word is so powerful and so true. This is a host of people, Lord, and I'm grateful for every one of them and those that are watching this moment I pray that there would be something that begins to shift in my heart I must be saved above all else whatever the cost I want to make sure that I'm ready but more than that God I, I want to love you more so falling in love with Jesus letting your grace and your presence surround and wow me again God, I know, Lord, you're reaching right now. By the power of your word, I'm asking God for hearts to be open and spirits to be open. I pray where the enemy is at work, I denounce his work right now. And I speak over this house, God, a sovereign, undeniable, clearly, wave of your glory. I speak of that on our young people and every man and every lady in this building. I pray that in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. In a moment, I'm going to open these altars. I'm just saying, if you, you want more of Jesus, you want to fall more in love with Jesus, you want to get some things right with Jesus, you want to make sure you're in alignment with his word, these altars are open all across this house. Would you come and spend a few moments and just make sure, God, there's nothing more important than me making sure that I spend eternity with you. Come on, that's it. Just be you and God. Just you and God. Just, just having an honest conversation. You and God, just an honest conversation. Oh, God, you see your people, Lord. You see the need. You see this congregation. You see where the enemy, you see, Lord, the challenger. You see the battlefield. You know. But I'm asking you, oh, God, 
You redeem us with your loving kindness. Your loving kindness is better than life. God, you have brought hope into our world and you have brought transformation into our lives. That God, we truly can be, Lord, what you have called us and asked us to be. That's it. Forgive me, oh God. I ask you to wash me, God, completely, Lord, fully. I'm asking you, Lord, to purify my heart, my mind, myself, my life. I need you, you oh God. Come on, that's it. Just you and God. Come on, just let your spirit open up to him. God has come to here to fill you with hope. God's come to remind you. He is offering you a chance and an opportunity. He's offering you a moment right now for you and him to connect in a supernatural way.